thanks so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be going after my old sites in the lab with Brian Drew. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of a victory lap of this project I've been working on for a long time, uh, starting with my postdoc work. Uh, we're getting to the point of actually submitting a taxonomic revision within the month of this group that we've been working on for a long time. Um, this is a story of collaboration between molecular systemists and plant taxonomists. Uh, originally, Kelly Shepard at the Western Austr Australian Herbarium in Perth found out about me because I'd submitted an abstract from botany at the beginning of my postdoc that I was working on this, and she was amused and horrified to know that she too was working on a postdoc on Gimeliaceae. So instead of racing, we decided to collaborate and she was very happy to cede all the molecular stuff to me. She has access to the plants, the field, the specimens, and so it's worked out really great. And I'm really proud that we're actually revising the taxonomy now. Um, others have involved, my former postdoc, Andy Gardner, Emily Sessa has done a lot of the work with the next generation sequencing stuff we've done, and a whole lot of great uh, undergrads at liberal arts college. Okay, if you are Australian, you know and love good in Yaisi. This is one of the largest families in Australia, though certainly no acacia or eucalyptus. Uh, it has dispersed out independently, repeatedly, uh, into the Pacific Islands, most notably within Hawaii. At this moment, time flies now, there are 12 genera and about 420 species, so we're going to be changing that. Good in Yaisi is sister to Asteraceae plus Polyceraceae. And the key synapomorphy of the family is a unique cup-like endusium that surrounds uh, the stigmatic region. While the flower is in bud, it collects and packs pollen, so when the flower opens, uh, it's presented to pollinators. Okay, I'm going to kind of blaze through our history of phylogeny building and then spend some real time on the taxonomic conclusions. Okay, our first phylogeny looked across the whole family. Uh, Sanger of two chloroplast loci, and we had about 36% of the described species included. And as you might expect, we found some big clades, but there was a poorly supported backbone. This is what the phylogeny of good and easy looks like. Uh, it broadly resolves into two clades, the lad clade, Lechenaltia anthodium and dampira, and the much larger core good and easy, monotypic Brunonia australis, sister to the two big sister groups, Gavinia SL and Skeevold SL. And very quickly, you could see there's some taxonomic issues in this particular group, the largest of these clades. Gavinia sensulatu. Okay, so zooming in on that, species in Gavinia resolve into three groups, which we formally call the A, B, and C. And then there were affiliate genera embedded or potentially sister to at that point in time. Um, this suggested there's going to be major taxonomic implications for this, but because we lacked the sampling and the support, we didn't want to make the changes at that time. It was fortunate that this project uh, was supported by the National Science Foundation, and so then we moved into a twin approach of getting as many species as possible from across Australia. There was so much help from so many herbaria and collectors. Um, so did an expanded Sanger data set, as well as kind of anchoring the backbone with genome skimming. It was 2013, it was what you did, right? <laughs> okay, so from that, we pulled out about 100,000 base pairs of the chloroplast genome, 41,000 so far of the mitochondrial genome. I had an undergrad really excited in that. I hoped it would be some magic silver bullet. It was not, it was actually might not be surprised, less useful than the chloroplast. 85 cost loci, which kind of let me down as well. Um, and we did a, we combined all of this and also did a lot of hypothesis testing, got it into MPNE, um, and it fixed a lot of the backbone issues, and there was great congruence at the deepest nodes, but then a new problem emerged within this clade C, which has the greatest taxonomic um, diversity that we'll talk about with the biggest implications. And we kind of reached the end of the road for what we could do with these genome skimming data, truly. And so um, we both decided, Kelly and I, that it was time to make the taxonomic changes. I had wanted to get her a well-supported, fully bifurcating phylogeny, and we weren't <coughs> quite able to do that in this key group here, but we moved on anyways. OK, 
Okay, so this is where we are at present. Now we're looking at just a big expanded Sanger data set, which includes, and we're very proud of this, 95% of all described species in this group, as well as many potential uh, new species. And so our efforts at taxonomy hopefully will spur a lot of uh, uh, species description as well. Um, we're not too concerned about the backbone, but uh, we'll show you the major clades here. So looking within Goodenia clade A, what I'm going to show here on the right is the current taxonomy from the monograph for the floor of Australia by Roger Carolyn and all of his students, and features that kind of unite historically the groups that they authored. This is kind of the typical Goodenia bilabiate uh, flowers, generally the yellow spread across Australia narrow-winged seed. Uh, we have it resolved consistently into two groups, but then there's a couple of tricky friends that jump in. Oh, I should say too that Goodenia ovata, which is the type, which we'll talk about at the end, is within this group. Um, we were surprised to find initially several potentially independent evolutions of fan flower in this group. It's very skeevil-like. Uh, this yellow in here, this thing that's currently placed in Scevola, Scevola colaris, and this very tiny genus Celliera, which has kind of fleshy fruits that float well and have made it to New Zealand and even to Chile. Um, so they have very different fruit types and floral symmetry compared to the rest of the group. Okay, Goodenia clay B has a lot of sectional diversity, very, very large group of species. We have it resolved into four clades, Porphyrandes 1 and 2, and Ebracteo lady 1 and 2. I'm emphasizing our informal clade names because you'll see taxonomically what we do with them. Um, a look at some of these, Porphyranthes and Amphichilla. Uh, these tend to be in kind of the wetter northern Australia, in a lot of like ephemeral wet areas. These ones are really tiny and have little red fan flowers, and again, kind of minimal seed wings. There's a lot of floral and fruit characters that have been historically used in good and easy taxonomy. A much larger group, the Ebracteo lady, these are much more of a diversifier in the central arid region and a much broader seed wing and kind of the more typical uh, goodini like flowers in this group. And then finally, uh, the challenging Goodenia clade C, the one that I could not get a true final story of how these major clades are related to each other. We resolve it into seven groups. And Carolyn has this in a lot of different taxonomic groups. There's three affiliate genera, two subgenera, and a repeated evolution of blue flowers. This was a fabulous group for evolutionary biology, comparative studies, and pollination studies as well. Closer look at those groups, uh, we were surprised by this little clade Arthrotrica, put together some species that Carolyn didn't put together formally. Uh, they're all endemic to the southwestern Western Australia, the floristic province that's a global hotspot of botanical diversity. Kelly then subsequently was looking at synapomorphies to unite these. Uh, they share glandular hairs. Here's one of another blue flower group, subsection ceruli, it is monophyletic. Uh, another blue flower group with broad, wide seed wings. A total surprise, this group we call tetrathylax. Carolyn has most of its close relatives in that clade A. Back to the yellow flowers again. But again, Kelly worked really, really hard and found that this group shares a unique inflorescence and seed coat features as well. Potentially an independent evolution to blue flowers is this subsection Scevolini. These are northern Australia. The other blue ones were in the southwest uh, and a smaller seed wing on that. They're just gorgeous. Um, what a group we've been consistently finding over the years as monophyletic is the subgenus Monachilla. Fan flowers like a Scevola, and most of them have these little dots. Um, and a very slender, narrow in, uh, indusium. Here you can see kind of a time-lapse shot of pollination by some sort of hymenoptera. Uh, Australia has a really rich uh, um, uh, non-eusocial bee fauna, and it would be really cool to do a lot of pollination work on that group. The smaller genera, Verosia, again, a southwest endemic, so is its sister, Pentathlon, and they share unique attributes, again, of the ovary and the fruit that they define them for now. And finally, the big little embedded genus, Valea, 
uh, which even gets up into New Guinea, and most of its body is in fluorescence, really beautiful flower, uh, flowers. Say goodbye to all of that. <laughs> so what do we do, right? What I really wanted to do was solve what was in here. Maybe we could have grouped some of these. And I'm, I guess, a splitter. I really liked the idea of authoring new genera. I may have said I was doing that at a job talk, and it worked out. But anyway, I don't have to live with it the way Kelly does and all of the Australian taxonomic community. So I gave Kelly then, uh, you know, go forth and do what you feel is best with a taxonomy, right? And um, she's awesome and very thorough and is connected to the community there. And so, uh, like with Salvia, what we prioritize, right, is naming only well-supported clades. Don't really know groupings in here. And we value stability, nomenclatural stability as a community. So if we had done what I wanted, right, which was to retain these lovely endemic genera to Australia, and made some more, this is what that would have looked like, and that would have resulted in about 160 or so names changed. But what we're opting to do, of course, is to sink those into expanded concept of Goodenia. One thing that I will admit is a little bit hard is this whole group broadly, it's hard to find great synapomorphies for. There's great synapomorphies for these smaller groups, more mo um, morphologically. There's great molecular synapomorphies for the whole clade, but it's a bit hard to define as one. But Kelly is on it, right? So uh, this is what we're doing, and we are um, authoring then subgeneric groupings for those clades that I talked about. So clade A is now going to be subgenus Goudinia. The two major groups under that, section Goudinia and section Rosaliti. Clade B, subgenus Porphyranthes maintaining the sections that were kind of there before. And then subgenus Monachilla now blooms over all of that. Valea is now a section, as is Barocia and Pentathlon, and those smaller affiliate groups as well. Um, speaking of typification, through this process, Kelly found out there was an error done long ago. Uh, we, Roger Carolyn had proceeded as if Godinia oveda was the correct type, but he found, uh, Kelly actually found out that instead, no, this Godinia ramosissima was what was the very first Godinia described, with, but had, had previously been put in Scivola. So therefore, that was not valid. And Celiera, that tiny little guy, was the next available name. If we hadn't have done anything, you would have had to have thrown all of that into Celiera. But luckily, we, cons we, we published a paper to conserve the type and apply Eudemia Omeda as Roger Carolyn uh, wanted. So that's what we're doing. I'm proud that we've come this far and we're doing that work. And I must say, it's really wild looking at, you know, a ready to submit tax on paper with the formal name change and seeing groups you've been calling something forever and seeing what it will be pending peer review in the future. So with that, and I can't wait to move on to other good NEC projects with my great undergrads and my great Australian collaborators. Uh, so with that, thank you very much.